just we, we did it as a webinar on on zoom right. uh, but we weren't putting it on facebook so it's cool i can see on this end that it's uh live on facebook recording. okay so it's not a world i don't it's not a world exclusive that i have fraser quelch live you've been live before well i know i think this is a world exclusive of of fraser quelch live with me being interviewed perhaps certainly in the last right. year or so so All you know right. we can call it that that's amazing. Word is easy for the buckle dialogues. <laughs> um, um, all right. Well, we're talking enough shit. Hello and welcome to everyone who is joining us, whether live or watching recorded or on Facebook or whatever. Um, uh, and we're, we're very glad to have you here in these pandemic days. Um, my name is Dan Edwards. This is the Parkour Dialogues. Um, I'm very lucky today to have the amazing Fraser Quelch with me. Um, if you don't know Fraser, then you've probably been living under a rock, especially if you're in the fitness industry. Um, this internationally renowned expert uh, is a founding team member of the revolutionary training company trx um which you know obviously is a is a huge company and, and a massive um uh cog in the in the fitness machine um and he's also an award-winning presenter who's been featured at conferences events all over the world including appearance on the tedx stage fraser combines an animated entertaining style with his knowledge and gift to motivate and aspire his provocative presentations have been known to stretch the minds of his audiences and provide relevant and effective training solutions in a practical setting. Um, and I've definitely seen that at work myself in my, in my history with Fraser. So welcome, Fraser. How are you, man? I'm doing really well. I'm, I've, I'm always struck when, when I mean, because obviously I wrote what you just read, and it always sounds so bad. <laughs> When it's just red, it reads so, so much better. But it's, it, <laughs> but I no, mean, it's, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here, man. It's, it's always great to catch up with you uh, on, on, on any format. So this is going to be super fun. Yeah, uh, I mean, in that, you know, bios are always the way, right? But um, they, they always sound weird. But um, the fact is, it's an understatement because, you know, I know, I, I know, uh, obviously, I've known you quite a few years now and I know what you've done and what you've achieved and what you generally achieve in your day to day training and, and your lifestyle and things like that. So, you know, that short bio is definitely an understatement um, and, uh, and a misrepresentation of everything that you have done and have achieved and how um, central you are in a way in the in the fitness industry globally. Um, you know, so my, when I met you, uh, I think it was at AFC, the Asian Fitness Con Conference in 2012, maybe. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, something like that um, in, in Thailand. And we've just been brought into the fitness industry at the time, you know, parkour had just sort of been, had been, we'd been sort of dragged into that industry and were kind of getting to know that world a little bit. And you were the, pretty much the first, um, you the only thing I really remember from that conference. Um, and you're the first person I met, you know, sort of at that conference that, that, um, uh, that really stood out. Um, and I remember, you know, we were, we were running our workshop in the same space. You were going to run yours, but we had it a little bit. Um, we had different times, obviously, and you had your big A-frames in there um, for the TRX um, uh, straps. And we, we, you know, we wanted to use your, a we were playing on your A-frames, probably without even asking. Um, and then, you wanted, and then to, wanted swing to swing and climb on them. And I was, yeah. I was all about it. <laughs> yeah. And you, and you, yeah, exactly. You said, yeah, my girlfriend, we, we were like, we were just like, oh, that's super cool. So, but I had no idea who you were. I just thought, oh, the TRX guys are really nice. They're, they're, you know, they're really nice crew. Um, but then later I found out that you're like one of the, you know, the co-founder of TRX training and the, and the, the guy that created all the education and still leads, you know, a lot of that education. And, uh, and, and I said, shit, that's the guy that found the TRX. So, you know, that's a, um, that was, that was a, that was a really cool thing to experience. And then to see that you were such a down to earth, nice guy. Um, and, you know, you see, you at the same time, big impact. I was thinking, oh, this is the guy that like was one of the like one of the one of the very original guys of parkour. And my God, he moves like a cat. So I, mean, <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> Tell me that. I mean, you know, you've got obviously you've achieved a huge amount in that industry. Um, how you know, what was your journey into the into into this vocation that's be needs to become your life? Well, to begin with, I was an athlete. <clears throat> and you know, I like to I like to still think I am, although a much more aged one. Uh, and so it was through athletics that that and the training for uh, I mean, I went through a bunch of different cycles of sports as I as I grew up. I really all the way through high school and into university, I was primarily focused at basketball and was training. My, my training was was targeted at that: how to go faster, how to be how to be stronger, jump higher. And um, on the other side of that. I just kind of fell into the fitness industry. It seemed to be, it was an obvious, it was an obvious thing to do. And then just sort of grew along. And by the time, by the, I mean, prior to TRX, I'd you know, done what a lot of people do. I started off like working at a YMCA and, and, you know, cleaning equipment and working the gym and then slowly working my way up to, uh, um, 
get to, to managing those spaces and learning about that side of it. And then I did a little stint in on the sales side. So I understood kind of the business behind it and working with the, uh, and working with club owners, which was really, really interesting. And then, and then really got into personal training. And, and that was really kind of my first, like I really, really liked that kind of impact I could have with people, that training, the science behind it, all of that. And it connected directly with what my own personal experience was with, with training. And through that, met some, was lucky enough to meet some really, really great people that, um, you know, were at about the same stage and we created some things together. Dan McDonough and Tim Boris were the, the, the two fellas that, uh, you know, we really started to be entrepreneurial with. And, you know, so the beginning of TRX was I was, I created a cycling program because at that time, uh, indoor group cycling was essentially, you know, aerobics on bikes. The people who had done that programming originally were by no, I mean, no problem to their own. They weren't cyclists. They were, they were group fitness professionals. And so when they were presented with, Hey, we got a program for this bike, they brought kind of group fitness onto the bike and there was, you know, kind of dancing around on it and jumping. It wasn't authentic to what the bike really mm -hmm. was. At least most of it wasn't. And I thought there was an opportunity to take this stuff. I was very involved with triathlon at that point and coaching a bunch. And I thought, well, you know, like I could, if I could bring the science and the experience from true cycling into this indoor group cycling world, it would be, it would be valuable and, and, and interesting. And I think would be less of a sellout because I didn't think the programming much of the program, not all of it, but much of the programming was not authentic to what right. actual cycling was. And so I created that program and it got picked up by a, a company called summit cycle at the time that didn't have an education, but they had a really great bike. And so I was at a trade show supporting that company with my education when um, I was introduced to Randy Hetrick, who was the actual founder of TRX. Mm. And he was looking for someone who could build programming. And when we had a mutual friend or the CEO of Summit Cycle had a mutual friend with Randy and they introduced each other and Randy started talking to him. His name was Todd or is Todd McKendrick. And, and he said, well, I've got a guy who could do just that. He's over there in my booth, you know, riding his ass off on a bicycle. And so, um, that was how Randy and I first, first got going. Um, you know, he, he had some needs around the suspension trainer to try and expand the exercise library that he had already created and develop some education that was targeted at the, uh, at the fitness space specifically. And so, you know, we started off doing that as a contract and as employee number two, basically. And, and, uh, and that was coming on 17 years ago. So it was, uh, it's, it's been a little bit between now and then, but there's the, there's a quick background story of, of kind of how I got into, came, came through into the industry, but it really started off as being an athlete. And, and we're going to go more into that manager athletic background for sure. But, um, and we're not, I don't want to, I don't want to talk the whole time because I know that, you know, you're, it's, you've done this, as you say, 17 years. So you've spoken probably to the nth degree on fitness and the fitness industry and all those modalities and all that. And we do want to go into it a little bit, but there's, there's, you know, much more other stuff and, and kind of, um, more sort of almost personal stories that I want to go into. But, um, uh, we do need to cover that a little bit. So, you know, 17 years, um, in the fitness industry. Um, what all that does is says I'm old. <laughs> That's really all that says. It's <laughs> He's still feeling pretty good for old. So, um, <laughs> um, you know, but what, in, what, when you started and now, what did you see? What I want to know is like, what did you see as the problems? What, what are the problems in the fitness industry then and now, or, or have there, have they remained the same? Um, you know, are they still there or has things changed? But what, what are I the problems they're... with the fitness industry? I think they're evolving as we go along. I mean, some of them are are, are similar, but I, I do think that they're uh, they've they've evolved a little bit. I mean, the thing that struck me about the suspension trainer on the front end of it was was one the breadth of what could be done. You know, like Randy and I had this first conversation, and he showed me the stuff he created, and I was intrigued. And I am a typical like skeptical Canadian in terms of new shit, right? Like ah. And, and I, I, it's tough to sell me. It really is. But I was intrigued. And Randy and I hit it off personally. We had a great conversation. We talked a bunch over that event. And he sent me home to my personal training practice with a suspension trainer. And in the two weeks that followed, I trained every single client I had, including myself, with a suspension trainer. And I was amazed at what I could solve with it from a movement perspective. And I loved, I'd longed to find 
performance as your ability to move your own body through space. And I think this is probably why you and I were so aligned with, with, because mm. I know you have some, some similar ideas uh, around things. And to me in athletics, with the exception of, you know, some of the lifting sports and that sort of thing, if you have a stronger ability to move your body through space at a high level, you can stop faster, you can jump higher, you can, uh, you know, decelerate, you can accelerate quickly, you can be explosive in multiple ranges or multiple directions. That's where the game breaking plays are. That's what separates you from your competitors. And, and also I have, and I'm sure we're going to talk about this, uh, a climbing background and, you know, your ability to interact with your own environment. And that's what I loved about the suspension trainer is that it was targeted at your resistance was your own body. We've had for a long time, the moniker, which Randy came up with, make your body your machine. Mm. And I love that. That one spoke to me um, as it's, as it's spoken to others. But uh, so that was the first thing. And I think that the, the industry missed that. Uh, and continues to miss it to some extent. One of the one of the concepts that I kind of got introduced to it on a on a low level, and then expanded on it was this idea of being able to train in multiple planes of motion and doing it purposefully. You know, and if you take any program, and I've done this literally hundreds of times with different people, and you can grab, drag a program off the internet that's that's well done. It's done by you know reputable people who are really talented, great programmers. And if you break it down from a plane of motion joint by joint perspective, you'll find that it's almost always at least 70% of the movements are happening in the sagittal plane. Mm -hmm. uh, and only 30% of the movements happening in the frontal, the transverse plane. And of those 30%, almost always the majority of them are at the shoulder joint. There might be one that happens at thoracic spine. Very rarely will you see it uh, in a program that, that you'll see something for the hips in the transverse of the frontal plane. Well, as soon as you're not going straight forward or straight backwards, mm -hmm. we got to move in the frontal plane, the transverse plane, and those other joints. And, and the other thing is that our whole body is oriented from, from a, you know, a muscular perspective in the transverse plane to take advantage of that plane of motion, the only plane of motion that's not loaded directly by gravity, right? So it actually, we're much more efficient when we have a rotational component to our movement. And if you look at the orientation of, of our musculature, it's all on angles, almost all of it, almost none of it runs in a straight line because it's trying to create and capitalize on the fact that we have one plane of motion that's not loaded directly by gravity, which is rotation. And so that means we can generate a ton of force if we capitalize on that kind of stuff. And, but yet the training that's done traditionally doesn't do that. And so I think that's, that continues to be a, a challenge for people that to, to think it's getting better for sure. I mean, the whole functional wave that started about 15 years ago and introduced, you know, wide open spaces and different tools that demand, you know, more, more compound and complex movement, I think is really good for us uh, in general. You know, we got away from the body, but not there's anything wrong with bodybuilding. I don't think there is. Aesthetically, it's still the most efficient way to if aesthetics is what you're after, bodybuilding is, is what to do. But if you want to move then and move well, then you have to, you have to have that kind of approach. So I think that's still, it's an, it's a, it's a problem that's improving, but still a problem. Uh, the other one that's, um, that's big is, and I think this is really important is meeting people where they are in terms of play and having fun with movement. You know, and if you asked, and this is the way I, I approach this one, if you ask a room full of people, hey, I want you to take a second and think and write down your top three physical passions. Meaning, if you had the whole day to do anything you wanted to do, and this is what my TED Talk is about, uh, anything you wanted to do, what would you put down there? And, you know, everybody writes them, writes them down and thinks about it for a second. Now, if you ask them what the last three things on that list would be, like what are your bottom three physical passions, you'd probably find a high percentage of the population would write down stationary cardiovascular exercise and strength training. Like very rarely does that come, even a room full of fitness professionals, and I've done this, when you ask a room full of fitness professionals, say, okay, how many top three included stationary cardiovascular exercise or strength training, pure strength training? Um, no, mine don't. Not my top three. Now, maybe if we had top five, okay, we'd probably get there. But my top three, like, would I rather do a strength training session or would I rather go rock climbing? 
okay, I'd rather go rock climbing. Would I rather play basketball? I'd rather play basketball. Would I rather ride my, ride my mountain bike or go cross country skiing or alpine skiing? Probably rather do those things. And somewhere four or five, okay. Yeah. Like, I mean, I enjoy strength training. Well, if I'm one of the leaders in the industry and it's not part of my top five, what about all the people that are coming to the gym? You know, and, and so I think it's not that what we do is bad. It's that we don't wrap it and gamify it in a way that makes it interesting and fun. Right. And, and, and also introduce other movement-based things like what you guys do with parkour. I mean, some of the stuff that, that you've introduced me to from a, from a parkour standpoint, some of the hardest things I've ever done before. Um, you know, some of the, some of the things that you've achieved and, and we, we joked about this and I think you may have talked about it in one of your previous podcasts, but I remember having a conversation with you about five years ago and we were talking about challenges I'm like, Oh yeah. I didn't you know. I talked about this battle rope challenge I'd done and this jump rope challenge I'd done. And I'm going to, I'm going to be honest. I'm, I was feeling kind of badass about my 47 minute consecutive, uh, you know, like continuous battle rope <laughs> until you told me good. you did it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for humoring me, you jackass. I don't know. And just 47 for the audience, minutes on a battle rep is, is Dan, I probably wouldn't want to do that. Dan had said to me, oh, yeah, mate, that's cool. I like to do some challenges too. And I said, yeah, really, that's awesome. Like, like, give me an example of one. He says, oh, a few months ago, we wanted to see if we could do a thousand muscle ups in a day. Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that would be like in the bottom, as you said, that would be in the bottom three of things you want to do. It, you it's know, one of the most it, preposterous day, things right? I've ever heard of before. But anyway, um, that aside is an unbelievable human feat. Um, yeah, like some of the stuff that that you're able to do and the way I've watched you move, you know, being able to to muscle up to to uh, to your feet on top of a bar. Well, it's unbelievable. You know, like the unbelievable ability to move in a parkour space and and um, and. Uh, and so, yeah, I think, the, and it's fun. You know, that movement itself is fun. Those challenges are fun. A thousand muscle ups in a day is, there's nothing fun about it. I would call that no, type two fun. fun. Yeah, that's not fun. Uh, maybe it. type three fun even. But, uh, but yeah, like those, those two challenges, I think are probably the biggest ones in the fitness industry mm. right now that, um, that are getting better. Mm. And, uh, and obviously we've got the stuff associated with COVID and all those other things. Those are big challenges from a business perspective. And, and those are different though. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think you're spot on um, in terms of if you're looking at like, you know, retain, how, how many people does the fitness industry reach? Like how many people go and train in gyms and how many people work out as, a, you know, exercise as a pastime in that way? Um, it, it's probably only ever going to reach the people that actually in some way enjoy going to a gym to train. So and, and you're, you're right, the majority of people probably don't enjoy that so in terms of retention you have to find ways to people only stick with stuff they love doing they only stick with mm. stuff for years for their whole life if they if they really enjoy it so if they don't enjoy it they're not going to stick at the gym for long which is what you see in most gyms the retention is terrible in most gyms right it's just across the board so um and that's probably because most people don't actually like being there so you've got you've got to find ways to make it um enjoyable and you've got to find you've got to find ways to uh give people access to movement pastimes that they that they love um and that they, they find it fun and engaging but also work them in the way that you know nature intended um and and get them uh, and get them um develop all the, all the systems that need to be, need to be developed so you are spot on um the question is yeah how can the fitness industry how can the fitness industry do that how can they get better at that well i think that ties into one of the things i forgot to mention i think it's probably way more important than the first two that i talked about and that is, and you started to touch on it here, and I know that you're passionate about it. You post a lot about this kind of stuff. And, and I'm always like, yes, 100. I totally agree with that. <laughs> you're, you're the guy. Um, and I, I'm actually might've done that to what you posted today, but, <laughs> but then it ties into it. It's the, it's the differentiation between motivation and discipline. And, and motivation is the kind of thing and, and how you can get your headspace into it. Because that I think is probably the biggest missed piece um, within the fitness industry and in that motivation waxes and wanes. And we're, we're just about to, we're just about to find out, we're just about to come into a period of time where everybody's mm. motivation is really high, right? New year's resolutions come in like this year is going to be different. I'm going to change it. People get motivated, right? Like I'm going to do it. This is the year. And they start whatever it is, they're going to start. doesn't matter what it is. 
and, it's, and it doesn't even have to be fitness related, but they're making a change, right? Could be nutrition related, could be fitness, could be lifestyle, could be anything. I want to learn to play the piano, whatever it happens to be. And they start and they're motivated. Motivation wanes pretty quickly, pretty quick, as soon yeah. as stuff gets hard, right? Like as soon as you hit a roadblock, oh, I'm not so motivated. I was up too late last night. I had too much to drink. I'm, I'm sore from what I did yesterday. I don't have time. I've got a busy day at work. All of a sudden motivation just is, it's a fickle friend is motivation. Yep. Discipline endures, but discipline is harder to come by and discipline needs help, right? Like discipline needs a kick in the ass sometimes to get to get it there. You've got to build structure around discipline to help support you with it, you know. And whether that's having a training partner, a group of people that you're obliged to, you know, you know, if you don't go, you're going to let them down. Yeah, really or powerful. or being really good about your documentation of the stuff you're doing, so you can see your improvements, which kind of feeds your motivation, which makes the discipline a little bit easier to do, or create streaks. You know, like if you've, if you've not missed a day for, you know, you had, you say you've a whole week went past, you didn't miss a day. Well, the next week, if you miss a day, all of a sudden now you're giving up a streak. Mm. And that's where some of the stuff around like the Apple watch and it's rings and the streaks and stuff that measures, yeah, yeah, there's yeah, a psychology yeah. behind it. So you know, that idea method. of, yeah, how can I support telling friends, like, I'm going to do this setting those little short-term goals that allow you to reward yourself and see your progress. That aren't so much like, did I get stronger? Did I lose weight? Those are hard long-term goals. Whereas just the achieving of things, did I complete this set? Did I, did I raise my, my resistance? Did I do an extra rep that I couldn't do before? Those things are, they, they create a positive upward spiral, right? As opposed to a, a negative downward spiral. And, and I think that, that psychology of of the difference between understanding there's a differentiation between motivation and discipline and motivation is not enough you'll fail if that's what you're relying on because it will it will fail you it will leave you it's fickle and trying to find what are the what are the systems i'm going to put in place to create that discipline to make it a lifestyle where you're just not going to miss it becomes part of what you do and when you talk to olympic athletes or professional athletes or athletes at a really high level, that's the one common thing that every single one of them have is that they all, even if they're incredibly talented, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard is a, is an adage. And it is so true, right? I mean, if you're not willing to work really hard and all the people that have achieved anything great have worked their asses off to get there. You know, and you see, you don't see them do that. You see them on the podium, you see them on stage, you see them, you know, when they're shining, the light is on them. There's another saying that I like, which is it's, it's what you do in the dark that puts you in the light. Mm. And that speaks to discipline and, and the systems that you put in place to help support you will keep you going in the dark when there's nobody else there. Yes. And I think that's uh that's one of the most important things that's missing. So does that, I mean, following on from that, does that tie into, if I ask you the question about longevity, so, you know, you've been, you know, you're, you're, you're a young man, you know, you know uh, you're still a young man, but you've been training for a long time, as you've already explained. So, um, and you're still, you know, super fit, um, achieve loads of amazing stuff in your, in your career, uh, still go out and live a very, very active lifestyle. Anyone that follows you online will see that you're always climbing mountains, going hiking, going camping, skiing, running with your dog, you know, whatever you're always doing you know, a really, really active lifestyle. Um, so, and, and I know you've overcome some, you know, serious physical setbacks in that time as well. Um, so what are in your experience now, what would you say are the key components to um, longevity and to lasting and to staying fit and healthy for a long, long time? I think one of the things that became very clear to me uh, a couple of years ago, and I'll talk about it in a second when I had, I had an aneurysm in my ascending aorta, which was something that had probably been there, you know, most of my adult life, and it was invisible and got lucky that we found it before it actually mm -hmm. killed me, but it resulted in, you know, an open heart surgery and, and, and everything that goes along with that in order to fix it. And, you know, when you're confronted with a life-threatening situation like that, I mean, I was really lucky. I didn't have some dread cancer that may or may not come back. I didn't have something that was, you know, like, Hey, this is going to, this is going to progressively kill you. And there's, we can, we can do everything we can, but 
you know, it's, it's the kind of thing where they find it and that's the lucky part, put you up on the lift, fix it, let you back down, you recover for a little bit and you're back to the races. You know I mean? My chess modeling days are over, but to be honest, they, they were kind of, they weren't, they weren't that lucrative in the first place. So, um, anybody's, I can only do specific work now. Anybody's looking for a long longitudinal scar that goes like from the top of my, <laughs> like the bottom, base of my neck all the way to the bottom of my sternum, I'm on your guy. But you know, when you're confronted with stuff like that, it, it puts things in stark perspective. And, and one of the, th and it also, it made me think a lot about what I see from people as they age. And, and the first thing is you don't have to accept it gracefully. The whole idea of like, I'm going to age gracefully, bullshit. I'm, I'm going to age kicking and screaming the entire way. I'll age. And you have to be accepting of, you know, mm -hmm. things are going to change, but you don't have to be like, oh, well, I guess this is the new me. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to lie down in front of it. You know, you can confront it and do the things that are, if you want to live a certain way. And I do, I want to live, I, being able to express myself physically is an incredibly important part to myself, but also I think your quality of life are determined by three major things. Um, there's other things that certainly impact and influence, but those three things are your ability to use this, right? If you lose your ability to lose you, like your, your mental faculties at all, your, your quality of life plummets. Right. Uh, that's, that's really, I know it's nearly two major things. Your ability to use this and then your ability to use this. Right. If, if you lose either of those two things, even a little bit and your quality of life just literally plummets. And I said it before, and then obviously the social components to that and emotional components to that and who the, who you have around you, all of those things impact our quality of life, of course, but those two things are pivotal. And for me, you know, I want to do everything I can to ensure that I can use those two things at the highest level for as long as I possibly can. And, and that I think is that will set up all the other things. My social network is based around my ability to use those two things, right? If I lose those abilities, then my social network is going to be impacted in a big way, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and the social piece of quality of life is really important too. So having that perspective is interesting and not, and, and being willing to fight it a little bit. So I've, I've, I've referenced basketball a couple of times. I still play, I'm 51 years old. I like nothing better almost than to get on a basketball court with a bunch of people who don't know me and have you know some 25 year old guy be like, okay, well, I guess I'll take the old guy. Whenever that happens, I just <laughs> smile. <laughs> nice. Because, you know, my hope is that I'm about to start to, like, school will be coming, will be in, will be in and this guy's going to be so pissed off that as he's thinking, how is this old guy beating the shit out of me right now? <laughs> like, how is this happening? Like, they just, it's almost like it can't, com com like, this doesn't compute <laughs> and it's hilarious. But it also makes me, if, I mean, it, yeah, maybe that's a little mean. But it also makes me feel really good about myself. Like I can mm. still compete against a kid who's just out of university and, mm. and, and played at a high level. Um, and, you know, like I can't do the things I used to be able to do. I can't play above the rim like I used to be able to do because one of the things that we do lose as we age is, is, is our, our power output to some extent. Mm -hmm. But yep. we, don't have to, we don't have to lie down completely to that. We can still try. You know, like we can still, like, can I dunk at 50? Well, not so far, but I'm still there. So we've got some, some training to do. Like you can have those kinds of goals that many people associate just with being young and, uh, and keep going it. You know, like I have a couple of kids and my goal is that, you know, like I will pass the torch to them. They will be better at the stuff that I've introduced them to but they're going to have to rip the torch from my hand. I'm not just going to give it to them. You know what I mean? And my goal is to, <laughs> is, to, is, to, is to do that. Like, hey, I'll be proud as hell when I can pass the torch. I won't be happy about it necessarily, personally, but I'll be proud. Mm. Um, and that's just fun. You know what I mean? Like, it's just fun to, to, um, to keep striving for stuff. There's no reason for us not to. And so one of the things to answer your question is a long way around it. But one of my approaches to, to longevity is 
surround yourself with youthful people. Mm. You know, it doesn't matter what their age is. Surround yourself with youthful people. Those who are still charging. That'll make you younger. Just, mm -hmm. just by proximity. Mm. You know, the mindset of that, I, I think, is important. Don't just accept the fact, well, I guess I'm getting older. Well, yeah. I mean, a 25-year-old should be able to beat the hell out of me. But I don't need to let them. Mm. Right? Like, what if they can't? What if I'm doing work that they're not doing? What if I'm using all the old guy tricks that I have that they haven't learned yet to, to yes. stay ahead of them? So those are things that are just fun. I, I, I mean, I'm a competitive person. I like being in a competitive environment. Uh, I like to compete with myself. I like to... So that's one side of it. And the other thing is just experiences. You know, your life is richer when you can engage with the world at a physical level. And you talked about some of the ice climbing stuff that I post or, or getting out by myself and doing things and mm. just get to get to places that you don't, you can't get to if you drive there. But in order you, to do that, you've got to be able to, you've got to be able to exert yourself. And you, I mean, you, you're pretty experienced with that stuff too, right? The, uh, the adventure side of things, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, you, it seems you're constantly, um, you know, wh whether with friends or with family or by yourself, you're constantly in some way, pretty regularly, you're going out and um, experiencing the natural lifestyle, um, you know, and, and, and putting yourself out there, like you said, taking, taking challenges, climbing ice walls or whatever, you know, camping out in the mountains. You, you obviously live in, a, in an incredibly beautiful um, part of the world. So, um, which, which is a, a good choice. You know, it's not, it's not that you're lucky. It's a good choice. Um, so, um, uh, you know, how important has that been, that, that kind of adventure piece, which is outside of the realms of traditional sports science or fitness or whatever. But, you know, th that side of thing is, as you say, it's, why, it's probably why we stay fit is to be able to do that. Um, so how, how important has that stuff been to you? It's super important. And I think it feeds you in a way that's different. Like that it's, it's, uh, and we've talked about a little bit of the diversity of some of my, my physical passions, but climbing it. I, and again, one of the reasons that you and I, I think uh, aligned and connected the way we did is that there's, so in every sport in every activity, there's a physical piece, right? There's a physical challenge. And in most sports or activities, there's also a mental challenge to it. There's a problem to solve whether it's, you know, how do you, how do you, um, how do you displace a defender so that you can get by him? How do you create space so you can, you know, execute whatever it is that you need to do or put yourself in a position to score or whatever it happens to be. Climbing, parkour, surfing, those sorts of adventure sports have an emotional component too. And there's not that there's not an emotional component in the other sports, but the other sports probably fighting would have some of this as well, at least to a certain point. You and I've talked a little bit about this in the past where there's fear and, and not just fear of failure, which I think exists in everything, but legitimate life-threatening fear. I could die doing this, or I could get really hurt if I don't get this right. And sometimes it's just perception of, of consequence. You know, the consequence might be much lower than what our brain perceives it. But if our brain perceives it, then there's an emotional control that has to come into place. And, and that happens in climbing a lot. And I think it makes you a much stronger person. It certainly happens in parkour. We've talked about it where you have to like, should I do this? Shouldn't I do this? Even at a higher level, because in parkour, there's generally not safety built into the system. Hmm. Climbing, there's safety built in the system. Generally, you're with a rope, but you might be a long way out from that last piece of protection where you're not looking at a five foot fall. You're looking at a 20 foot fall, a 30 foot fall, a 40 foot fall, right? Mm -hmm. Where you might hit stuff. And all of a sudden that becomes, that becomes, you know, life threatening. I mean, the, a few weeks ago, I posted a thing of, of, of me going ice climbing and it was just went up something that was very easy, similar to what you do in parkour. It was in kind of a flow state. I'm not, I don't think I'm going to fall off, but if I did, be bad. It would be bad, right? And and so even if it's something that's well within your your ability, as you know, there's a sharp there's a sharp attention or focus that has to go into it if you're going to engage in that kind of thing and expect to do well. Now, I'm certainly no Alex Honnold. I'm not going up and doing hmm. you know unbelievable feats that that um, the, like where. It's, it's right on the edge of what's humanly possible, which by the way, I mean, his ascent of, of, um, of El Cap 
might be one of the greatest athletic feats in the history of, of in the history of the world. It's definitely uh, human, human yeah. athletic feats. And most people don't look at it like that, but like, honestly, I could probably train for the next three years and not be able just to climb that thing mm. with a rope, let alone consider doing it without. Uh, and most people don't understand just the, yeah, it's just, just gonna... how difficult that actually was. And, and what a, it, it might be the greatest feat in human history uh, athletically, but that's, and I want to be clear, that's not the kind of stuff that I'm doing. If I'm climbing without a rope, then it's something that's very, very easy to me, but it still has that emotional control. And even with a rope, you're safe sort of, but mm. depending on how you interact with that, with that consequence, I have a really good friend of mine named Grant Statham, who has a, an incredible model around risk and how the interplay be, between uh, the elements of risk consequence being one of them and, and exposure and, and all that kind of stuff, which is fascinating. But anyway, um, that's, that's kind of how that, that adventure sport, how I interact with it. Again, it's not about a rush and it's not about a thrill. It's about a place that you can both get to physically, uh, but also emotionally and mentally. There's a, mm -hmm. there's a different kind of focus and attention. And then, you know, the environmentally where you end up being is, I think that's maybe my favorite part, being up way high on a place that the only way to get there is, is under your own power and, 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 and skill and expertise there's there's something that's uh that's pretty special mm. about that yeah i know that feeling i mean and you talk about fear you know and, and obviously fear is a subject um that i'm really interested in um give us an example of um you know what's the what's the situation you've been in on one of these adventures where you felt let's say the most afraid and how did you manage that fear well i'll, I'll tell you a story that i don't know that this was the most afraid I've been, but this is one of the coolest kind of climbing stories that I have. There's a, there's a, a, a really long ice climb in the Canadian Rockies called uh, Slipstream. And it's not super hard. It's really big. And it's got some really big objective hazard that sits over top of it. There's these big seracs, which are, as a glacier pushes out over top of a, over top of a cliff, the seracs kind of cab off over time, right? And it's, they're not, you can't predict when they're going to go. Um, but they're house-sized pieces of ice that if they did go and you happen to be in the way, they'd, they'd scrape you okay. off of the climb like you're an ant. And so this, this climb has got some of that objective hazard overhead and there's some avalanche hazard as well in it. So you have to, you have to manage your time. It's on, it's on a, um, uh, it's on a mountain called Mount Snowdome, which interestingly is the hydrological apex of, of North America. So the joke is if you pee on top, you can pee into three oceans simultaneously. Uh, cause it's the high okay. It was just kind of fun. Right. But anyway, um, big long ice climb. It's 900 meters, I think. And, and the, the faster you can do it, the safer you are. And because of the overhead hazard, you're trying to get out from underneath it. And so we climbed this, this was years ago, but we, we soloed meaning climbing without ropes because it means it reduces the complexity and increases the speed through a lot of easy terrain, kind of probably the first two thirds. And then as we started to navigate through the, the um the snow slopes we roped up for it and that was all fine and the very top like you, the last pitch kind of last 30 meters of this giant climb you're working on the i guess must be the east face for most of it and at the very top we had to climb up this sort of fluted snow ridge and the snow is very unstable and so you're you're but on on either side there's 900 meters of air to fall down i mean you're with a rope and you're but there's not a lot of protection in the snow. So it's not a great place to fall. And then you get to the actual ice cap, like the glacier itself, which you have to end up climbing the, the glacier that sits on top of this, of this mountain to, to, to get off of the vertical. And in that you had to transition from the east face onto the north face, which means that at some point um, you've got one ice tool on the east face and another ice tool on the north face and you're hanging as you transition from one to the other okay and the north face overhangs for the entire 900 meters of it so you can imagine 900 meters of gently overhanging rock and so as you transition onto that ice the exposure and if you've never been in that position in the parkour world exposure is there all the time, especially as you go up higher, but exposure is just the amount of air behind you that mm. it, it, it makes it feel 
like it's higher, more out there, crazier, wilder yes. than it would if you're at the same height and there was, you know, it was, it was, it was off ankle. And so you transition onto the North face and then climb a few feet and then put in a piece of, this was actually what happened, put in a piece of, of uh, ice protection, which is big, these big honking screws that you screw into the ice and clip into it, which made me feel a lot better. And then it climbed a little bit higher, but then the ice turned into kind of more hard snow. So you couldn't really get any protection in. So now I'm about seven or eight feet above my last piece of gear with the 900 meters of overhanging north face below that. And there's a little cornice, not a huge one. It was maybe like a couple foot cornice, which is really just a, it looks like a wave of snow going over top of you. And so you got to kind of tunnel your way through, that. through the okay. snow or, or like create a slot. But again, your, your tools aren't into strong ice. They're into hard snow. And so you can't put any gear in. Like I said, it was maybe eight, nine feet above my last piece, something like that. And you, so you're climbing up and you're high on your tools. Your tools are in the, in the last good spot. So they were kind of down by my hip. I'm kind of hanging onto them here. I've got one tool and I'm like throwing one arm up like this, trying to smash a little slot through the snow so I can like wriggle up. So I smash the slot and I wriggle up. And now I've got like my shoulders in the snow and I'm, I'm almost topped out. Like my tools are now onto the slope above the climb. Now ice tools have got, one of them is usually an, there's two picks, right? On the back side of that, one is an ads, which is like a, like a, a, like a bladed fin like this. And the other yeah. one's a hammer for banging on stuff. Right. So the ads you can use in hard snow and it holds you pretty good. The hammer, of course, you can't, and the pick's not going to hold in there. And so I had the ads in and I was up there, my shoulders are wedged into this little gap and I've got my other ice tool pounded in. I'm thinking, okay, like there's the grand tour of the North face if, if this goes bad, but I need to advance the ads so I can climb out. This is the last move of the whole thing, right? But the ads is the only thing that's really secure. The shaft of the ax that's in the snow is, it's not super secure and I know it, right? But mm. I have to wait it in order to advance the ads. And so I thought, okay, plan A make sure that that's in there really well. I'll load it as lightly as I can and like get the ads, like advance the ads as quickly as I can. I should be fine. If this sort of levers out, plan B is to expand my shoulders into the snow, okay. like kind of hold my body there and like advance the ads and then I'll be okay. And so I'm like, okay, again, the grand tour of the, of the North face is, is, is if this goes wrong is what you're thinking about. And so there's certainly, I mean, I wasn't afraid, but I was certainly aware mm. of what was going on. Anyway, so, you know, I, 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 I'm like all set. I like grab onto that tool and make sure it's in there good. And I pull the ads out. And as soon as I pull the ads out to advance it, this levers back like a gear shift would. And I'm like, whoa. And you start to like, Shit. you start to come out. And I'm like, <laughs> And as that happens, I'm like, right, plan B, right? I, I plan for this. I expand my shoulders. This adds is up here like this. I haven't been able to put it in yet. As I expand my shoulders, everything to the right of me crumbles away. Oh. And so now I'm like, <laughs> there wasn't a plan C and the grand tour of the North face is, is imminent. <laughs> like it's about to happen. Obviously I'm not gonna go all the way down. I'm gonna fall in on the rope, but still there's fear associated with that. And so I'm sure. like, ha, 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 as I'm falling away, I like, I managed to put the ads in. It happens to hold. I get to breathe a sigh of relief, climb up out of the, out of the cornice. And that was the end of the climb. Like that was, it was literally the last move. And so I know that's a long drawn out and detailed story, but, um, that's probably the most exciting alpine experience I've ever had. I mean, I've had, I've taken falls on, on, in high places before, and those were exciting too, but, um, but that was pretty exciting. Yeah. I, was, I, I must say, I, you know how every person, so I, I can only speak to every man definitely has the secret dance of joy. He usually does that like after first kisses, that sort of thing, you know, you're all suave and cool <laughs> until, you know, the door shuts and then everyone's got their secret dance of joy, whatever it looks like. <laughs> as I recall, I did my secret dance of joy on the top of that pitch. Once I could stand up and was far enough away from the cornice, I was pretty happy to be all right. 
I'm sure. Um, I mean, that's and it was amazing. Time to summit and peed on the hydrological apex of North America, as I recall. In, in three different oceans. <laughs> exactly. Simultaneously. You see, most people would be afraid in that situation, but you use the word exciting. You say that was the most exciting moment. It was exciting. Yeah. I mean, there's been other times where I've been actually afraid. There I was really focused. And, um, you know, I had a plan. I, I must say, I was, there's probably a little bit of fear as that snow kind of bounced away. And I was like, Oh, yeah, but there's sure. not really, in that case, there's not really time for fear. Mm -hmm. You're like, <laughs> yeah. you're just trying to survive. You're really. in the moment. You're in the um, moment. You know, I think had I taken the fall, there would have been fear perhaps during the fall and right afterwards. You know, like, you, you know, okay. Oh. Then, then I think it hits after the fact. And in other times I've been, been afraid, like way out from my piece, not really trusting my, like I can feel your hands starting to come off of the rock or whatever, and know that you really don't have enough juice to yes. make the next move. You're trying anyway, but you're pretty sure that the outcome of what's about to happen is you're going to fall. I think those are more when fear takes over in the moment, because you know that like there's, there's very little that can be done other than, other than fall. And, and then, you know, that's what the redundancy is. And that's what the, you know, the, that's what the rope is for. Yeah. Climbing is uh that kind of climbing. I mean, it's amazing. And it's a great, um, that's a, that's a really um, powerful test of your mental control and your ability to deal with fear long-term because, you know, in many other disciplines, the fear is momentary. You know, you uh, certainly often in parkour, the fear is kind of momentary because it's before the jump. And then, you know, you, you find, you manage it, you manage it, you overcome it, you do the jump and, and it's gone. Whereas often in climbing and my limited experience of climbing um, is this way, you're, you're kind of, you have to deal with the fear for a long time because you're, you're hanging on this rock, you know, trying to traverse it or climb it. And the whole time you're kind of aware that if something goes wrong. I'm going to, it's going to be a long fall. So and, and you can't just step back from it, you know, whereas in, in other disciplines, you can decide not to do it. You can say, oh, I'm not going to jump or yeah. I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to drive my, my motocross bike and do that huge leap. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to skateboard across the wall channel. I'm just, I'm just not going to step on the skateboard today. Whereas when yeah, you're so halfway that's the up the emotional mountain, piece. you can't back yeah. out, right? That's, that's the emotional piece that I led into and, and, and climbing offers that control where if you can control your emotions, like, hey, this is scary. I don't know if I can do this or not, but I'm, I think I can, right? Like, I'm gonna, I'm yeah, gonna commit. Uh, that, I'm gonna okay. commit to this, uh, and and that's gonna be. Um, I believe it, and and yeah. and that's where you kind of take your fear and be like, you got to compress it. And you can't do this when it's, it's sometimes the fear is too much and it'll just, it'll just blow it up. Um, and so, yeah, you've got to, you've got to compress it and manage it and, you know, hopefully it works out <laughs> and you make the right decision or you got to go down. Cause that's the other piece. Like sometimes you're in a position, you're like, you know what? The safest thing for us to do right now is go down. And so you got to make good decisions. And I think, you know, when you test yourself, in those sorts of environments, that's when, when, when you get into a regular business environment, well, it's, it's nothing, there's nothing life threatening about it. Mm -mm. You know, like it's, it's, it's a big decision. It maybe has big impacts in, in your life from that, but you're going to be okay. Yep. So it gives you perspective of, of what, um, and allows you to think clearly. And I think you and I might've talked about this before because of your martial arts background of which I have none. But I've always marveled at how, and you talked about martial arts just not being interesting to you anymore, but as you came into parkour, because you hadn't felt fear in a long time, mm. like there wasn't anything scary about it. You, you were, you had such mastery that, uh, and been in that situation. And, and you see that familiarity in MMA probably, a lot yeah. where, you know, people are in a terrible position that a normal person would be afraid in. And you can tell yeah. they're not afraid. They're thinking, right? Like, because they have so much control. Yep over they've been they've, they've trained in that position so many times that they just nothing scary about it it's it's, it's okay i'm gonna be all right you know and like come away with it looking a little different than i do right now but i'll be all right mm. and that's that's an interesting that's an interesting control of of fear that emotion would you say that um that that 
you know how to how to manage fear or that that uh, familiarity with fear is the is the greatest thing you've learned from nature or is there something else that your time with nature oh, is the we... no i mean in in nature i think it's just it's such a powerful force to be part of it makes you feel small inconsequential the mountains especially do and the ocean mm. but, but do that you are I mean, the ocean's actively trying to kill you. The mountains are just kind of passively trying to kill you. Like if you fall off and they don't really give a shit. Mm. I mean, you don't mean anything to them. Mm. You feel, I, I feel often in those big places, just um, just in awe and, and energy filling. You know, those big places just fill us up. You, you can't not be in a place like that and be and just not be overwhelmed with with those experiences. And especially, I mean, you can ride a gondola to the top of something, or you can, you know, be, be on a cruise ship out in the middle of the ocean. You're not going to get that experience. Mm. But if you got there under your own power, dealt with the adversity that comes along the way of, of, of being in, in those environments, because natural environments are like, everybody wants to be in a natural environment on a sunny day mm. yeah, or, or to be dropped off and go, wow, isn't this nice? But what, what they're missing is what those natural environments give when you earn them. And uh, you know, so the biggest thing I've learned, humility, I think, is probably one of the greatest things that, that those big places teach. Uh, they teach us about ourselves. You know, they teach us when to go, when not to go, how to deal with our emotions, uh, how to be calm under pressure. And that's kind of where I was getting with the fear thing. If you don't manage fear, you will not make good decisions. You will not execute. It's like blinders. All of a sudden, the world gets really small. As soon as you start to look through a tunnel, you don't see the sure. solutions to things. Whereas if you're able to manage fear or just your, your, your emotional control, you can see your emotions. You can articulate yourself properly. You don't get those blockages in your head. You think clearly. So I think it's those challenges, those environments have taught me that. And they've just given me experiences. You know, I mean, I think that's probably the biggest thing. It's not so much a learning, but they've provided me with these experiences that are so deep that I can, like that climb I talked to you about, that happened more than 10 years ago. Mm. I remember it perfectly. Yeah, yeah. Like I can remember every single thing that happened in that little see i can't remember the, the stuff leading up to it because it wasn't difficult it wasn't challenging but that little segment i can remember every emotion every detail every i can remember how that ads felt when it finally went in i can remember that i, can, I remember what it felt like listing off to the side and it going into space so those those experiences are so profound that uh yeah they, they change us in, in a great way mm. so i don't know it's hard to articulate no oh, that's awesome man um and the you know you mentioned the aneurysm and um i remember when it happened yeah it was pretty you know i remember just thinking wow how did you know what's this about how did this happen to, to this guy um who's, you were you know, the only one thinking that um uh, exactly i mean and that's you know that's something to, to that's interesting to go into as well because you know you recovered inhumanly quick from it i remember but um uh which is probably a testament to your 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 prior fitness and strength um and all your systems being so healthy before it happened because then you recover faster so so i'm sure that's that's a great you know another great example of why it's an important thing to to look after yourself um but what did that experienced teacher was that the first time you sort of realized that you weren't invincible or what did that teach you um i've had friends die in the mountains before so i knew that i wasn't invincible certainly but um what that taught me most was it's first of all life's real short there's a great there's a great story that that was told to me at, about um, a measuring tape, a tailor's tape. Have I ever told you about the tailor's tape before? Mm. So imagine, okay. imagine tailor's tape. If you stretch a tailor's tape out in front of you, and then everybody listening can or watching can do this. Imagine it's on a table in front of you. Tailor's tape is 100 centimeters long, right? Zero on the left, 100 on the right. So if you put that tailor's tape on the desk in front of you right now and, and draw your finger along until you find your age in centimeters, just put your finger there. Everything to the left 
is gone. I mean, that's what's made us up till now. Those are experiences, those are memories, but we can't influence any of that. Everything to the right is the maximum of time that you have left remaining to you. And so the question is, what are you gonna do with, and who are you gonna be around for all of those little millimeter marks between now and whenever your time on the tape ends? Because there's a good chance you won't make it to the end of the tape. You know, it could be that you're gonna make it one centimeter past where you are right now on the tape. Yep. And when you think about that tape and think about that concept, it's really powerful, you know? And it makes you, it makes you question, who am I spending my time around? Like, who am I gonna share this with? Because honestly, if you're not, if you're not helping me, I ain't got time for that. Like if you're not part of a positive experience that I'm trying to create, and obviously we'll have negative people coming into our lives, but we don't have to tolerate them for very long. Mm. Uh, so I'm, I think I'm probably much less tolerant than I was because of that, maybe post. I think one of the biggest things I learned was just the power of mindset. And I, I think it's something that I've always been pretty good at, but uh, you know, afterwards, um, I remember people telling my wife at the time, like, oh, you should you know, he's going to be depressed. You got to be watch out for some like depression. Ain't nothing to be depressed about. Like I didn't have any depression at all, mostly because like, Hey, I have to accept where I am right now, but I don't have to like it. Mm. And I don't have to, in this, in this case, like in my specific case, I'm, I don't, I have no intention of staying here. Right. So you talk about like how quickly I, I, I was able to recover and I was lucky. One, it was something that you can recover from pretty well. And I would describe myself as being cautiously aggressive in that, yeah, they tell you, you don't push or pull anything for 12 weeks. Mm. Well, bones don't heal like that. Mm -mm -mm. You know, and, and, and primarily with, the, with my procedure, the surgeon told me, hey, like 10 to, 10 to 14 days after procedure, everything we did your aorta is completely healed. You can run any pressure you want through it. That's not the problem. The problem is the bone, right? Because they sawed you in half essentially and pried you apart and then wired you back together. Literally, it's a very farm-like procedure. It's actually comically so, but that's going to take some time to heal. And it's like opening a, like a bag of potato chips, yeah. right? Like normally your sternum is one piece and pushing, for instance, your pectoral is attached to either side of it. Well, normally it's not a big deal for them to co-contract when that's one piece. When it's two pieces, it's a significant problem because it's literally trying to tear it apart. And so while you have to be, last thing you want to do is to tear it apart and have them to go in and, and you know, mm. put Humpty back together again. You don't have to sit there for 12 weeks and wait because bones heal a little bit at a time. And so, you know, my approach was I'm going to do whatever I can do, but no more, right? So what will my body allow me to do today? And I'm gonna do that. You know, like right afterwards, I think it was maybe the week afterwards, right afterwards, within three or four days, I was like trying to walk up and down stairs, right? Because they, they tell you like, you're on the table for me. I was on the table for 12 and a half hours, dead essentially, because they, they, they're, they've got a machine that's, they yeah, stopped hard. Good. And they've, they've got, you're on the heart lung bypass machine. So you're not breathing, your heart's not going, you're effectively dead, wow. but they're keeping your brain alive by having a machine pump the blood for you. And so one of the things your body doesn't want to do is inflate your lungs again. Your lungs don't want to inflate to full capacity. And so they have you breathing through this little inspirometer. And I thought like, this is crazy. Like I'll breathe through the inspirometer, but if I can actually get my heart rate up, then my lungs are gonna to have to work. And if my lungs have to work, then they're gonna expand. I'm gonna get back to my full capacity quickly. And so I started like walking up and down stairs, right? And then I found I could run up the stairs, not run strong. I could jog up the stairs, but I'd have to walk down because that ground reaction force was really, really hard on my sternum. And within two weeks, I was able to run up hills because I thought to myself, well, I can run up stairs. I could surely run up a hill. I can't run down the hill. I can't run flat, but I could run up because there's not as much ground reaction force. And so I was out there, you know, two weeks after my open heart surgery, trying to run hills. Now, let me be square running. I wasn't really running. Like, you know, that guy you pass on the, on the, on the trail who, who you walk past and he's running. Right. Yep. 
that was me. <laughs> that, but you, but you had a good reason to be that guy for a while. <laughs> but yeah, so, so I was running up there and, and you know, my heart feel like it's pounding in my chest and my lungs are expanding. I feel like I'm going to die because I'm on these beta blockers, which were awful. But that's what I would, that's what I was doing. And I you know, got, so if I did one hill repeat and then I would do two and then three and then 10 or whatever. And so I started doing that right away. But the reason I was doing that is because I had no intention on accepting the new me. Right. Like, hell no, this is not the new me, right? And we have a mutual friend, Emily Tan, who's, I think, the epitome. Her situation was so much more challenging than mine. But, I mean, she'd be, awesome. and I think you've had her on, I think you've had her on the pod, if I'm not mistaken. Or if, I haven't if had haven't, her on this one, but I've, I've been on hers. So. You've been on hers, yeah. that's right. <laughs> yes. But, I mean, like, she was doing, you'd see her, she'd be hooked up to, like, she had this terrible cancer that, um, she was battling and, and, and she, she was like all hooked up in the midst of her, like the worst therapy you can imagine mm. and dancing. You know, like that's, that's what I mean by mindset in that you, you have to accept where you are, but you don't have to like it. And you can do everything in your power to get back to where you were and maybe beyond it, you know? And that's, I think that's one of the things that makes me smile is that I'm, I'm fitter and stronger than I was prior to that procedure. Like I said, the chess modeling career is over. But other than that, there's not much I can't do. And that's that's not me so much like, you know, pounding my chest going, look what I can do. It's more something I'm proud of just from a mindset perspective. And I think that's, you know, that was probably, those are the biggest changes. One, a, you know, we talk about the idea of live every day like it's your last. It gives, it puts that in perspective. It puts, you know, what are the, what's really important in my life? And it's the people. Life's about who you spend it with and what you're doing, you know, like to fill up yourself during it. And yeah, we've got our careers and we want to impact people and all that stuff is really important. But on your deathbed, I can assure you that's not what you're thinking about. Mm -hmm. It's the, did I write a letter to my kids in case this procedure goes wrong? What do I want to say to them if I don't get a chance to? You know, what do I want to say to the people who are really important to me? Having conversations with friends. You know, I mean, when you and I get to catch up, I value those moments. Mm. I think it's valuing the moments that are and recognizing the moments that are actually important and the people who are important. Mm -hmm. That um, I think that's probably those are the biggest learnings from from that experience. And that that philosophy, I mean, it's a very stoic philosophy, man. And that, that philosophy is, um, you know, probably never more relevant than today, right? I mean, 2020 has been a, a crazy year for a lot of people. M most people have found it. Most people probably, not most, but let's say a huge proportion of people will, will, will look back on 2020 as, as a really low ebb for them, as a really tough year, really difficult, really challenging. Um, but as a result, a lot of people will also look at it as the, ch the time they reconfigured their thinking they bounced back they adapted they you know abandoned a path they didn't like and set themselves on a path they did like so and all that's down to mindset right so um do, do you how, how have you dealt with this year and do you think those experiences made this year manageable for you like all the craziness you know i think it's interesting because it's certainly this year i mean obviously it's a global pandemic in our lifetimes we've never seen it mm -hmm. not not like this people have lost their businesses um, you know, it's, it's put stress on, on, on people, you know, socially, emotionally, all kinds of stuff. Um, you know, suicide rates are higher than they've ever been. All those things are, are serious problems. I also think that it's, we've experienced more change in the last eight months, nine months than, and you could argue evolution in terms of where society is going to be and what our capabilities are, than then we're, we're to a place now that it would have taken us 25 years to get to in terms of your, yes. and I'll, I'll give you some examples. You now have the opportunity to live anywhere you want in the world and still work mm. for many, many people, not everybody, people in the service industry, that doesn't work. But, but for many people, you can work remotely. I think it's going to change the game in terms of where people live. Do you, do you have to live in London? Mm. Exactly. Nope. Or could you live in some beautiful seaside seaside place out in the you know out on the on the wild north coast if that's what your jam is you know if you want to live in london you love that energy then go live in london if you want to have a different experience i think little towns like the one i live in the reason why there's only you know 
10 or 11,000 people who live here, even though we're only an hour away from a major center is because people had to go to work there. Well, now like my neighbors, they used to come up on the weekends. They've been living here for nine months. Right. It's a way better lifestyle. I think it's going to change. Like what an opportunity. You can live anywhere in the world, man. And the fact that we can have this conversation, everybody has now figured out video conferencing mm, yes. and we can connect you know, like it's not the, not the same as like going out and hanging together and, and, and training together. But, you know, like you and I could do a workout together mm, yep. just like this. And people are open to that kind of thing when they never were before. I would argue that there's an opportunity to connect with folks just because of willingness and a change in mindset and acceptance that we never could before. You know, like while I haven't seen anybody physically, I haven't been anywhere I'm probably more connected now than I was before because in the past people weren't as accepting of things. I think there's opportunities on the other side of this that will continue to roll in and, and we're going to take a while economically to recover. You know, like, I mean, I lost my own marriage over this is one of the things anyway, um, because, because of distance, but, and so that's been a hardship, but on the other side, there's so many great things that, that have, that, will come out of it so i think it's putting your emphasis on the positive in that there will always like three years ago this coming april you know i someone sawed my chest open pried me apart and fixed something that i thought would kill me right so that was a shitty part of that year this year we had this like there's always there's always going to be stuff that's shitty and stuff that's great no matter what doesn't matter if it's 2020. I've heard all the people just lament, oh, 2020, I can't wait for it to go. But mm, there's yeah, going to be challenging that. shit in 2021. Yep. 2022 is going to suck in some ways, <laughs> right? Like it's just going to happen. And so like, oh, I can't wait for the new year. The new year means absolutely nothing. Yeah. It's, a it's, how, day, we're, yeah. it's how we're looking at it that matters. And so you're always going to have, first of all, accepting you're always going to have negative and positive in your life. And some of it, sometimes negative is going to be a little heavier weighted and sometimes positive is. In my experience, if you put your emphasis on the positive, like this is really great. And you've got to acknowledge the negative. You've got to work at it to try and influence and make it better or, or remove yourself from it. But if you put your emphasis on the positive, it casts everything else in a positive light. It makes a negative not so dark right? Not so grim. If on the other hand, you put your emphasis on the negative, like, oh, you know, I hate where I am. It's too cold here. It's, it's, you know, my business isn't going great. It clouds everything else that's positive and darkens it. You know, oh, I've got a great relationship. I'm around, you know, I've, I've got this amazing family. I live in this beautiful environment. All of that kind of gets shitty too, if you put your emphasis on a negative and that may seem like a simple thing to do, I honestly think it's unbelievably profound. Mm -hmm. And I think it can influence our decisions in a way that this, that's life-changing and I've seen it. And so, you know, so 2020 to me has, has, um, Hey, it's taught us to live in a, and function in an incredibly challenging circumstance. And when the next one of these comes along, and there will be, we'll be, okay, the whole world has got a plan. And in a weird way, when, when in, the, in, the, in the past has the whole world had exactly the same problem at exactly the same time? <laughs> yes, yeah. And, and all of us aligned and marching in the same direction, trying to solve the same thing. Mm. That's pretty cool. The fact that- It's pretty powerful, yeah. Nine months after the introduction of something, we have a vaccine that is now being deployed is astonishing. Mm. And that's because of everybody rowing in the same direction. So there's almost this global unity that's happened and it'll, it'll falter and, and fail and we'll get back to the regular shit that we always deal with. But, um, you know, that's one of the really cool things about, about COVID and obviously like I don't want to be insensitive. I've been really lucky. I haven't been impacted financially very much at all. Uh, uh, that's more luck than anything else. The company I work for happened to have 
be the perfect solution for training at home. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, that was, it's not because we planned for it. It's because we were lucky mm. more than anything. And there are lots of people that aren't lucky. There's people who have, you know, you know, there's people who've lost their lives or lost close ones to this thing that, you know, they might've been around for, for, for longer. That stuff's not okay. You know, like that's, that's, those are real challenges. And I just want to acknowledge that stuff as I talk about all the, all the, you know, the, the rosy yep. things about what, what um, this situation brought. There's some really, really bad ones, but I do think the big learning is your mindset and the positivity that you bring and where you put your emphasis. My mother, when I was growing up, she was teaching me to speak and it's something that makes me laugh. She used to say, Hey, you got to put your emphasis on the syllable. <laughs> right where we put our emphasis is really important because it it'll shade our whole life light or dark anyway that's very cool man i mean there's uh I, I you know i agree and, and while you while we do have to acknowledge the difficulties that loads of people have gone through the if you take the meta view you know i i i, I think it's extremely um encouraging that the human race has kind of responded you know whether it's got the initial responses right or wrong many countries have done it differently some have done it clearly badly some have done it clearly well um that aside the fact that the human race tries to respond very positively um and pretty much universally um to an unprecedented challenge that that is very encouraging because that shows that that's that's kind of an anti-fragile you know uh, nature that we have that this challenge comes along and the species finds a way to solve it like you said nine months and a vaccine in nine months finds a way to solve it pretty quick um and adapt to a completely new world and that that gives you hope because you think well pretty much you, you what what could you throw at the human race that it couldn't deal with mm -hmm. you know th that that's um uh that that's a pretty cool thing and i, and I think that's that gives you a, that's very encouraging i think that on, a, on a grand scale it's a very encouraging thing and a very um and a very hope giving um, way of looking at things so yeah while you do have to acknowledge the, the difficulties that that many have faced and the the losses that people have have suffered um on a grand scale it's it's actually pretty amazing how the world responded um and the fact that everyone was willing to take those steps and just go yeah okay let's do this let's let's do these lockdowns let's endure them even if we hate them let's endure them let's you know because they yeah. see the on the on the big scale it's the right thing to do that that's amazing it's probably never happened before in, in human history you're right probably that the whole planet has been focused on one problem largely obviously it doesn't mean all the other problems have gone away but but all focused you know all had that idea of there's this one thing we've got to deal with that's probably never happened in human history and it probably won't happen again until aliens arrive and then there'll be the same kind of oh my god everyone's dealing with it, right but um it's probably never happened before yeah so it is pretty it's quite an it's quite a profound time to be alive i think so it's why you say it's simple you know simple simple is not bad it is it is a simple thing that your thinking decides that um decides your world but it doesn't mean it isn't profound you know it's that's incredibly profound i think um as shakespeare said you know what um there is no good or bad but but thinking makes it so so hmm. your, your yeah. thoughts pretty much decide your world um and this year i think has been very interesting to to observe all the different responses to it and how some people have remained themselves and remained positive and and going about their lives and finding solutions and some people have really been um have not have not dealt with it well whether they've had losses or not, you know, and you, and you realize that it's actually not down to your circumstances so much. It's down to how, how you choose to think about it. Um, you know, uh, I know people that have lost people due to COVID and they still mm -hmm. remain, uh, they still remain positive. And I know people that haven't really been affected personally by it, who have been incredibly, you know, shattered psychologically by it, even though they haven't really had any <laughs> negative effects from it. So, mm -hmm. um, so it is very much down to mindset. And I think that it's very, very profound, thing um simple but profound well and the resilience that you talked about and, and the adaptability that um you know i think that the global population showed is encouraging i think you're bang on you know like that's that's yeah, pretty amazing, cool really. and and isn't it awesome to be around someone who's that positive light hmm. right like when, when we're in our own positive place and you think about the people in our lives you know when you're feeling down you've got that friend that's that's like always upbeat you know, like actually I'm, I'm going ice climbing tomorrow with a really good friend of mine. And he is the most psyched person I may have ever met before. <laughs> he's always psyched. Like, I mean, and he's just, he's awesome to be around because no matter what, 
he's fired up and that's really cool. You know, so it's, it actually, it helps you if you can actually, and to begin with, maybe it's not a natural space for some people to be in. Maybe they're a little more, you know, like level or, yeah, I'm going to focus on that, on that negative piece. Cause that's just how they're wired. But if you can kind of lift your head up and be like, yeah, actually I am going to put my emphasis on the, on the positive. It's um, yeah, to- totally changes your outlook, you know, mm-hmm. like anyway. Yeah, it's super cool, man. So what's on the horizon for, for Fraser Quelch next and what 2021 going to bring for you, man? Or what do you, or what do you, what, what do you, what do you want to do with 2021 rather? You know, it's, it's interesting. The, the, the more long in the tooth I get, the more I understand that, that I have, I'm very, very poor at understanding exactly what's on the horizon. Like, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm Nostradamus, I will never be accused of, I, I get it wrong all the time, right? Things that I thought were going to be amazing end up crumbling. Things I thought were going to be poor end up being great. I mean, I think that I was introduced to a concept once and um, I can't remember I was at a conference and it was a keynote speaker and he had this analogy of how life, uh, your approach to life can be summed up generally, but quite effectively, or the key to happiness can be found in the, in the, in the kid's song, row, row, row your boat. Right. Again, one of these simple analogies. So he went through it. He said, row, row, row your boat. That means you got to, whatever you're doing, you have to try hard. You've got to row, mm-hmm. right? Wherever you put your focus, you've got to pull, you've got to pull hard. Your effort counts. And it's something I try and teach to my kids. Like, I don't care how good you are at anything. I really don't. I mean, I'm going to celebrate your successes, all I care is that you try as hard as you can at whatever you're going to do. Row your boat. Gently down the stream. Don't be an idiot. Don't try and row your boat up the stream. That's counterproductive. It, mm-hmm. It's not going to work very well for you. So recognize that going with the current, you know, you can influence your direction across the current. And hey, maybe you'll have to work hard to go upstream just to get across it for a second. But eventually you can turn your boat around and row it down the stream. Be smart. Be intelligent about your effort, essentially, mm. and where you where you place it, the directions you put it in, and use the forces of nature, like har- harmonize with the natural. Exactly. State. Yeah, like work work with your surroundings. Don't mm-hmm. don't be confrontational against them. Um, merrily, 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 and we just talked about that. Focus on the positive. Be happy about wherever it is that whatever it is that you're doing. You know, be engaged. Be psyched. Bring your energy. If you do those three things life is but a dream (laughs) yes it's pretty powerful i mean it's 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 obviously (laughs) oversimplified but it's true and so 2021 uh you know there's some exciting uh there's some exciting projects that i think are going to be really great in 2021 and 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 so i'm just rowing as hard i hard, hard as i can in those projects i'm looking forward to seeing them come to fruition um 2021 is a period of transition for me like he's just said i mean um, you know lost my marriage in in uh in 2020 which was which was uh not something i saw coming at least in the long term but uh but you know it is what it is and so it's it's going to be a year of of new beginnings and fresh possibilities and things are that are that are different and interesting and and that's the if life's a river you have no idea what's around the next bend. You just gotta, you've got to make the best decisions you can as, as you, as you come around those corners and, um, and hopefully they work out. So, you know, I think that's, that's challenging for me right now, but, but I think it's going to be, um, yeah, it'll work its way out. I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm saddened by it, but, but, uh, it'll be, I can't control it. Yeah. And I think that's an important learning that I've thought about for a long time, but it's really galvanized for me um, is, is that, um, that's where I kind of lost my train of thought as I was going along there, but, oh, it'll come back to me. I've totally lost what exactly I was going to say. It was profound though, and you're going to really like it. <laughs> um, you know, that, but that whole, like, I, I don't really know where it's going. I'm not going to try and predict the future. Uh, I'm going to do the best I can and point my boat in, in in the Mm -hmm. right direction. You know, I've got these two amazing kids that are at an age that's just awesome. They're 10 and 12. And, and, uh, you know, I'm excited about helping them turn into the men that they'll be and watching that, 
you know, watching that happen and influencing it however I can. And so, yeah, 2021 is about, about, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really just, just about that kind of stuff. You know, there's, there's life is always full of transition. And, uh, I think one of the biggest mistakes we can make is, is not embrace those changes. People are so resistant to change and, Mm. you know, the people have really struggled with this, with, um, with the COVID situation, I think have been the ones that are most resistant to change, you know, it's like, okay, I have to change. And so why not get kind of excited about it? What an opportunity Change is an opportunity always there is. I mean, sometimes it sucks and it's hard while we're in it, but ultimately I think change is, is truly an opportunity to, to, to explore something that maybe you didn't anticipate and um, go with it from there. So I think yeah. those are the, those, those are the big things. That, I don't uh, think, that I don't done. think you, I don't think, um, I don't think it's a case that you suck a prediction, man. I think it's more a case that you understand that um, prediction is effectively impossible. So, you know, and there's lots of studies that show that humans are really, really bad <laughs> at predicting the future. Um, so uh, for all, for, for a whole number of reasons. So it's actually, um, it's actually better to not try to predict the future. It's actually better just to prepare yourself you know, to prepare, prepare yourself for the road for whatever comes rather than trying to, trying to sort of create a strategy to deal with an idea that you think might happen. So, Mm -hmm. so it's probably, it's probably, uh, it's probably a good thing not, not to be good at predicting or to be aware that we're not good at it because then you can just be like, forget that. I'm just going to focus on, on how well I do things here and now. Yeah. And, you know, I think if we're, if we're focused on, on our principles and our values and living those and, and, um, and trying to articulate your purpose and continuing to evolve our purpose, you know, like having a clear understanding of this is what I want to do, generally speaking, you know, like here's the essence of, of who I am. If you stay true to that, then no matter what happens, you're going to be great. Like it's, 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 you're, you're going to be great. And I know, you know, you, you have, I've always admired this about, about you is that, that, you know, you're a very principled person. Everything you do is based around those principles. Cause I've seen it, you know, I see it obviously in the stuff that you post, but in our conversations and knowing you, you're guided by your principles. And that's one of the things I really, really respect about you and, 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 um, and try and do myself because I think if we're, as long as we stay true to those principles, then, then we can't go wrong, hmm. you know? And I think that that's what I was going to say. I really believe that one of the biggest learnings that, that I've had probably in the last couple of years is that if you put everything you can in whatever it is you're doing, there's no work you could have done that you, that you left, no rocks to have to unturn, nothing that was left said or unsaid. You, you said and did everything you possibly could do to influence the situation. It's like training. Whatever happens after that, you can accept the result in peace because there's nothing more you could have done. Like everything within your, within your control, you are actually able to, you, you did. Mm. And if it worked out great, if it didn't, it never was gonna. Mm. And, and that way you can go on with absolutely no regret whatsoever. You know, if you did everything you possibly could do, Mm. there's nothing more you could have done or said. So everything else is outside your control so control the things you can and uh, i mean that's that's like a a cliche as well but it's very true well it uh, it is true and again you're you know you're the epitome of of a stoic you know that is that is control the controllables and and accept the uncontrollables is one of the key principles of stoic philosophy so um you know it's a cliche because it's um one of the oldest wisdoms in the world so um and i think it's a really good one to to, for, for people to embrace and most people's suffering comes from not understanding that you know and trying to control the things they can't control and then being right. frustrated at the fact they can't control them that's the cause of so much of our psychological suffering so and that's i think where the this really word, had it right yeah and that's where that word this word pivot has actually been really interesting watching people start to hate on the word pivot this year you mm-hmm. know because it's obviously been used a bunch and and i actually think the opposite i think you've got to embrace the pivot because, I mean, if, if you think of it, if you define a pivot directly, it's a change of angle on an axis, right? That's what a pivot is. Mm. Well, if our axis is our principles and our purpose, 
and maybe our our direction isn't working anymore because of the situation around us that we can't control, then changing our angle and coming at it from, you know, from a different area. You talk about, you talk about, uh, you know, fighters talking about finding different angles or coming from unusual angles, which is, you know, gets, gets past the defenses of their mm -hmm. opponent. It's kind of the same thing, right? If our opponent is life and our current angle is not working because it's everything we're doing is being blocked for whatever reason, you know, like, taking a step to the side and pivoting maybe all that we need to do to open up a completely different experience for ourselves. And so, and that's part of trying and being creative, you know, like when there's no amount of creativity you could bring to a situation, no amount of, you know, adaptation of, of effort, of, of um, intelligence, of, of, you know, trying to, trying to work your way through things verbally then. Yeah, I don't think you can, I, th I don't think you can help but succeed if you're working at it like that. So anyway. Dude, it's a great worldview, man. Um, we're at 90 minutes, man. I mean, there's been so many good learnings and messages in there um, for people. Uh, I think that's, you know, it's, it's always um, great to draw those out of people that have, out of someone that has actually lived that way, has that experience, you know, doesn't just talk about it, but lives that kind of lifestyle um, and has been through tough times um, and still maintains the same integrity, you know. So I think those messages are really strong for everyone watching and people who watch this um, in the future. Um you know, that, that, that's really great stuff. Um, obviously, everyone can find you via TRX, but is there anywhere that people can connect with you or find you sort of just you personally outside of TRX? Or Oh, um, yeah, my social, if you just look for, look at F Quelch, either on F -Quelch. Instagram or, or, uh, or, or Facebook, you can you can find me that way. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm always up to something. So yeah, no, that, right. And, and again, anybody who wants to reach out, ask me something directly, I'm I'm, I will always try and and uh, and respond to any kind of uh, yeah any kind of question query or or uh, or anything otherwise. So yeah, if if I can be of service to anybody in, in in any way, please please don't hesitate to reach out. And and my friend, it's always amazing to catch up with you. I, I, I really treasure the time that we get to spend together, and we live yeah, in different too, continents and everything else. But um, but yeah, always love always love chat with you, and look forward to the next.